Hi folks. Today we're working with two different ideas. <clears throat> we're going to talk about how the mechanisms of victim blaming work and why they're so effective. And we're going to talk about how oppressions within a household are different than the ones from outside of a household. So we're going to start with the drawbridge exercise and I'll tell you some of the responses that I heard from students and I'll let you know some of the ways that we might think about them. To begin with, we've got the example of the Baroness and the first twist in the story asks us to reconsider the idea that she didn't go out to cheat on the husband, but she went out to go visit a dying mother. And at that point, we might consider when folks have a big change of heart. What does that mean? Um, in many cases, people get really stuck on the idea that um, since she made the choice to go cheat, then she was responsible for everything that happened afterwards. We might consider the ways that we use women's sexuality to punish them. So. If if effectively we're saying people who cheat on each other deserve to die, we might wonder if we'd be so happy or so fast to come to that conclusion if it was the husband who was cheating and the, what, the wife came back and killed him. Um, we start to question this notion of who deserves what for what action and who gets to make rules and control other people. So if we were to say, well, let's say and this is the third scenario in which we're now talking about domestic violence instead of um, death. So we're saying uh, directly what would happen in Portland area today if this was a scenario. If we were to say, if you cheat on me, then I will kill you. And we're happy with that notion. We might go back and say, if you cheat on me, I'll beat you up. That's a lower consequence. Would we be okay with that? And um, having somebody who says, well, I told you the rules, you know the consequences, all you have to do is follow the rules and then you'll be fine. We start to kind of see it fall apart. We say, well, who gets to make what rules and impose what kind of punishment and who gets to control other people? What if the rule was um, not if you cheat on me, um, I'll beat you up. Uh, what if it was if you don't have dinner on the table at a certain time, I'll beat you up. It's kind of the same concept is that I get to decide what you do and I get to decide what the consequences are up to and including violence. And if we were to get a little bit more extreme, um, we might say, well, what if I made a ridiculous rule? What if, um, if I said, if you speak to any men, then I'll beat you up. It starts to kind of fall apart at that point. There are a lot of mechanisms that teach us and train us to blame the victim. This is something that's all the way around us, all across society. Um, sexual violence and intimate partner violence are one of the ways in which it shows up most clearly. When it comes to sexual violence, we have language like, what was she wearing? Was she drunk? Did she lead him on? These are ways in which we focus on what the victim has done instead of focusing on the perpetrator and say, why would they think it was okay to do something against somebody's will and impose uh, their wishes on somebody else's body? Um, in domestic violence, we hear it in a different way. We might say things like, well, why didn't she leave? Why did she come back? Why did she come back to the castle? There was no need for her to come back. And if we start to question the notion that somebody can make decisions for somebody else and impose their rules on them, it starts to get a little trickier. And this is what happens when you have kind of oppression within a household. You can have control in the most intimate ways. And this is where we see this happening in terms of domestic violence. Um, if we think of somebody having free will, we could say there's a hundred different choices that they could have. As we start taking away some choices and saying, well, you can't have this and you can't have that and you can't have that, then we may leave somebody with two very bad choices, which aren't really choices. And then we're getting into the spot that kind of becomes coercion. It's like, I took away 98 of your choices. I left you with two really bad ones. So some women who are um, undergoing intimate partner violence have to face really ridiculous decisions like, do I let my children go hungry? And there are some folks who say, um, I would rather get beaten up than hear my children cry from hunger. And that's the choice they're facing. And at that point, it sounds like a choice, but it isn't really because somebody else made the decision to take all those other possibilities away from them. I really like the drawbridge exercise because it lets us get at um, some of the deeper, more rooted thinking, because since it's 
presented as if it was far away and in a dif distant land, which it doesn't say, or that it was in a different time, which it doesn't say, we just assume it. Um, it lets us get to kind of the root of the stories that we've been taught. And when we bring it over to Oregon right now, the idea kind of starts to fall apart. And I love this exercise, and I've used it with all kinds of folks, everything from um, rural women in Costa Rica who don't read to lawyers uh, who work in domestic violence. And I've seen some pretty amazing responses. Some folks get really hung up on the notion that it was legal. And so they'll say it was like, well, it was legal at that point that the Baron could decide for everybody else what would happen because he had absolute power. And that's where it gets tricky because people say, since it was legal, it was also okay. So the difference between legality and morality is something really important. And we could say up until the last 30 years, um, there was no law that would punish somebody for raping their spouse. And while it may have been legal, we won't argue that it was moral. The fact that now there's a law doesn't mean that it was moral before then. Um, we're looking at victim blaming as a mechanism because it is a huge source of how oppression works. If we can focus on the victim and say, what are they doing? How do we change them? Then we get to ignore the entire structures and everything that came before to put people in that spot. So in the handout, I gave you the example of poverty, how we might blame somebody for being poor. And we might do it with the best of intentions. The thing is, when we get so focused on what these people are doing and how they're different than we are, we're going to find the response, the solution to the problem. We're going to find it in them. Oh, all we need to do is change them, and then the problem will go away. So we'll teach them how to save money and how to not have that much credit card debt. And that way they won't be poor anymore. Instead of stepping back and saying, somehow we've designed a system in which people can be paid very little for the work that they do so that they could work a full-time job and still not have the benefits of having a living wage. And we step back and say, that doesn't work. That's what that cookie example is telling you, is we had the guy with the crumbs and the guy with the one cookie and the guy with the 19 cookies. And as they point and say, hey, watch out, that guy is stealing your cookie, they get to take all the rest of the cookies and we get distracted. Victim blaming is kind of a distraction tactic so that we don't actually look at the place where the problem is. The Golda Meir story about raping in Israel is talking to us about the way that if we think that rape can be solved by putting a curfew on women, then we kind of think that the problem is that women are going out. We're saying rape is caused by women leaving the house. That doesn't make sense. If we step back and say, rape is being caused by the people who are doing the raping, which in this case was men, then we want to actually address that part of the problem and say, let's stop it at the root instead of focusing on the people who are floating down river. We're also talking today about um, oppressions that happen within a household and how they're different than the ones that are not. And this is something you can see on your social location map, all the ones that have the little broken hearts on them. This is some of the stuff that happens in the dynamics within a household. If we think about the control that somebody within a household can exert on somebody else, it's pretty extreme. They can withhold food, clothing, they can inflict physical pain legally, um, they can restrict contact, they can restrict transportation, and this is something that doesn't happen with the other oppressions that aren't within a household. So the dynamics are different and we've got to think about them a bit. We're talking about queer oppression as an example of these familial oppressions, but these dynamics repeat over different ones, for example, like psychiatric diagnosis or sizeism or sexism, when it's your father who can control everything that you do because you are a woman, then the dynamic is really different than if it was, for example, the factory owner or a racist cop. Um, so we're looking at some of the dynamics within a household and how they can be really different. When it's your own mother who's saying that you're an abomination, that has a different impact. It carries a different kind of weight that's harder to cope with. And this is where we're seeing one of the biggest risks for queer folks is their youth. Because they're under the control of somebody who can control everything from food to pain to clothing and how those dynamics work and how we might resist them is really tricky. We have the example of the two teenagers. We have the 
um, the Blackish video that you watched, where it's a black family kind of trying to train the young folks on how to deal with the racism that's outside of their family. How do you interact with the cops? What's happening in the outside world? And so they have this safe space at home where somebody kind of knows the skills to survive this particular oppression. And then we have the contrast of the teenager who kept rushing home to, uh, to videotape the, the soap opera so that he could watch himself, any kind of image of himself on TV. And I like this story because it talks to me about the desperation of just trying to reach out to somebody. Is there anybody out there who understands me? Is there a way that I can know how to be in the world? And having to connect through a TV as your only source of support is really heartbreaking. These are oppressions in which you may not have anybody around you who can support you and guide you. And when it's just yourself in a sea full of people who are telling you to hate yourself, there's really, there's almost no way to resist that. My favorite story from internalized oppression was from um, when I was 19 years old. I went to a party uh, with my first girlfriend um, and I was hanging out with one of her friends who sat me down and said, so was this your first kiss with a girl? And I said, yeah. And he said, so how was it? And I said, well, it was kind of fun, kind of sexy. And she leaned over and he was like, no, 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 like, but, but how was it? How did you feel? And I said, well, it was kind of exciting and kind of nervous and pretty fun. And, and he said, no, no, but like, how did you feel? And so at that point I was like, I think I'm not understanding you. What are you trying to ask me? And he said, so the first time I kissed a guy, I spent the whole night crying and puking. So for him, his first kiss with a guy wasn't exciting. It wasn't sexy. It was horrifying. It was him finally not being able to put that part himself down. It was him finally becoming the abomination that everybody said he was. So it wasn't fun. It was horrifying. And this is what happens when people convince you that you are awful. And that's what internalized oppression is. Something to think about is that having the family that you were born into is a giant source of privilege. We don't often think of it that way. It's a source of wealth. If we think of that there are folks that systematically lose their birth families, and these are queer folks, we got to think of those dynamics and try to incorporate them into the way we structure society. So for example, uh, FAFSA, financial aid, is uh, somewhat connected to your parents' income without taking into account that queer folks may not have access to that income in the same way that straight folks might. Another thing to think about is the notion of chosen family. So if your birth family has thrown you out and you've lost them, it may take you decades to build up a chosen family. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and they may not be around in the ways that you would need them to be. And after all that time and effort, the law backs you up in absolutely no way. So in my case, my best friend is a lot closer to me than my brother is. But since there's no blood relationship, the government and the structures don't recognize this as any kind of important relationship. So for example, in my case, if I wanted to help somebody migrate into this country, since I have citizenship, I could offer that help to my brother, but not to my best friend. Um, we're also thinking about the ways that uh, resistance looks different within a family unit. Um, when you are a teenager and somebody's controlling your food and housing, there's not much you can do about it. There's going to be a lot of times in which you need to deny yourself to make sure that you are fed and safe. Even as an adult, when you need to resist against parents, it's a different dynamic. So there are some interesting stories of sibling solidarity, like... Um, one sister giving uh, her trans sister clothing because the parents won't allow her to have female clothing or um, boycotting Christmas. And so if the parents say you can't come with your girlfriend, your sibling saying if she can't bring the girlfriend, then I'm not going either. And we're all going to have Christmas dinner by ourselves. And if you don't want any of us around, that's too bad for you. All of a sudden, the power dynamic can shift. But it's really dependent sometimes on age and the access to the support that you have. One more thing to think about when we're talking about queer issues, which is really important, is that for many folks, coming out may mean losing their birth families, and that can be incredibly painful. 
it could be equivalent to thinking of having all of your family die in a car crash. If that were to happen to somebody, we would have a lot of mechanisms of support for them. Mm -hmm. There would be casseroles and fundraisers and all kinds of ways to support this young person who's lost their entire family. When it comes to coming out, we don't have the same tactics around that. So as you're speaking with somebody who's queer, make sure that you honor the fact that coming out may be incredibly painful to them. That you may be asking about the time their whole family died in a car crash. Don't bring that up casually. Make sure that you treat it with respect and kindness and dignity. And that's it for today. I'll see you next week.